Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode, and I am really excited about this one. It is all about the objective morality of God. This is one of the excuses I hear most from the Christian community about why atheism can't be true because we don't have a grounding for our morality, and how dare I say something is wrong like slavery if I can't point to an objective source like God to get us there. So I'm not going to be addressing the objective versus subjective claims of morality in this video. I simply want to point out that God's objective of morality does not work. In typical fashion on this channel, we will be doing so with a list. I'm going to list 20 things that should be objectively wrong according to God, according to the Bible, according to the law that he put on our hearts. And I'm not going to use Christians as the example or the misdeeds of believers as the example. I'm going to use God as the example. Surely, if we have 20 things that are objectively wrong, according to this Bible, according to this God, then the number one person who should never break them without excuse would be God himself, right? Well, we're going to use the Bible itself to find out, and we're going to go through these 20 things that should be objectively wrong and see if God has trouble keeping his own standard of morality. If God breaks these 20 things... How much more are these fallible humans going to do so? And then what becomes the point of this objective morality? Now, I can already hear all the Christian excuses. A lot of what I'm going to be covering is Old Testament. They're going to say it doesn't matter. They're going to say we have a new law, a new covenant because of Jesus' sacrifice, Paulanity versus Christianity. So I'd like to point you to all of the verses about God's immutability, meaning God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If these things were important to God at one point and they were wrong at one point, they should be wrong now. If they are not still wrong, are they objective? You cannot have your cake and eat it too with this line of argumentation. So the immutability of God is very important to set forth. The other thing I want to point out is that Jesus doubles down. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Other believers might spout off about context. I promise you, I'm very careful with the examples that I'm using and you can go look at the context for yourself. So if you're going to tell me in the comment section, I'm wrong because of context, tell me how I got the context wrong. Now, what are we basing this off of? We're not going to base it off just the Ten Commandments because, first of all, there's multiple versions of the Ten Commandments. There's also about 630 laws in the Old Testament and about a thousand shoulds or bees. You should do this, you should be that in the New Testament. A lot of this contradicts itself, and that's really not my problem. It's God's problem. But we're going to go with a hard and fast list. In fact, I'm going to put it up on the screen right now. Here's 20 things that I think most Christians, unless you're just trying to be difficult, can agree are objectively wrong and would be objectively wrong according to God and the Bible and his character. Of course, there's going to be the odd man out who just cannot get on board with these. I don't care. We're going to major in the majors and we're going to start going through these 20 right now. So number one is going to be lying, right? We can all agree it is wrong to lie. Some of you are already screaming, well, it depends, right? What if the Nazis come to your door? Isn't it a greater good to protect people than it is to lie? I don't know. Not according to God. Bearing false testimony against your neighbor is actually one of the commandments, which is a little bit different than lying. But we see through many parts of the Bible, let your yes be yes and your no be no. We should expect that lying is always wrong if something is objectively wrong. And I could give you quite a few examples. My favorite to point to is usually Rahab lying for the soldiers and not getting in trouble. In fact, being blessed and preserved by God for it. But let's go with 1 Kings 22, 23. And actually, it's verse 21, and I covered this in my secular Bible study series on 1 Kings when we got to problematic passages. But in 21, it says, Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets. The Lord has declared desire disaster for you. Go ahead, look up the context for this verse. This is like God having a counsel with his spirits, coming up with a game plan of how he's going to manipulate the will of people on earth to create the action and desired outcome that he wants. And he does so by taking the suggestion of a spirit who says, I'm going to lie. I'm going to create them to lie. The Lord says, yes, do it. Let it be so. This verse is absolutely inexcusable. Not only does it completely interrupt our free will, but we have a God who is endorsing, commanding, and saying, this is the plan I want. And I will make sure that it works. And the plan is deceit, 
and lying. This seems really clear to me. Now, for some of these, we're gonna go in more detail and some we will do less. On the bottom of the screen, I will put up a few other verses that I think pertain to each of these objectively wrong things as we go. So you can look up more for yourself, but I'll usually just do one or two examples. So let's move right into number two and let's go with killing babies, infanticide. Surely killing babies is always wrong, right? Don't the preachers and pastors and apologists love to point to the inherent dignity of people, of how God formed you in the womb and knew how many hairs you had on your head? That's taken out of context. For the abortion arguments from the Christian perspective, we hear all kinds of these things about fetuses, yet alone actual babies and small children. So I'm sure God never ever kills babies. But let's go ahead and turn to Isaiah 13 and we'll jump up just to the immediate verse. The context starts around verse 11, if you would like to go back. But in 16, he says, their infants will be dashed in pieces before their eyes. This is a punishment from the Lord, by the way, killing these people's babies. I talk about the example all the time of the punishment for David for sleeping with Bathsheba and having her husband murdered was to torture and then kill David's infant son for seven days. Go read it. We could talk about the flood. How many babies and fetuses died in the flood? We can talk about all the firstborn sons of Egypt that God murdered after hardening Pharaoh's heart so that he could perform this plague. Granted, many of the firstborns would have been older, but many would have been babies. Many would have been toddlers that had absolutely nothing to do with the captivity of the Jews. Not that that existed. How about in every single genocidal command, and we'll talk about genocide in a future point, where God says, yes, actually also be sure to kill the children. Or that time when Moses got mad because all of those boys, the little boys had not been murdered. They had been spared. And he said, nope, let's fix this right now. And one by one by one by one, they killed every last little boy. You know why they didn't kill the little girls? We'll get to that when we talk about sexual slavery. But Brandon, none of this stuff happens anymore. I mean, we didn't see Jesus doing any of this stuff. We also didn't see him condemning it. We didn't see him saying, you know what? I was bound by the people and the time as if it was so different, as if morality had matured so much by Jesus's time that it hadn't in the centuries preceding it. He'd never said we were wrong back then, or we had to do what we had to do, but I'm here now going forward. Let's not do this stuff anymore. Nope. He's here to up hold and fulfill the law, to dot every I and cross every T. I'll give you one more quick one from 1 Samuel. This is 15 verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote destruction, all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And before you give me the hyperbole example that is so common in Christian apologists that really is founded in Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copin, I'd encourage you to see the follow-up. Go ahead and read context for yourself. Anytime that someone didn't follow this to the letter of the law, they were punished by God for not being severe enough, for not doing what he asked of them exactly. In fact, it's Saul who loses his throne to David because he was unwilling to kill the king and a few sheep meaning he had followed all of these other commandments. He really did kill the women. He really did kill the children. He really did kill all the livestock, but he left a few alive and he left the king alive. And God said, that's not what I asked of you. So the hyperbole thing is ridiculous. I have many more examples on this one. Again, go see my abortion video where I critique what inspiring philosophy had to say in defense to God with abortion. But this isn't just for fetuses and abortion. This is for all child murder or infanticide. But I digress. Let's move into point three. We covered that one in a lot of detail. Let's do something quick in point three here, like jealousy. Jealousy is something that should be objectively wrong, correct? Well, no, I'm married and I'm jealous for my wife. Okay, fine. You can play that kind of a game if you want. But jealousy falls right in with coveting, with lusting, etc. A 10 commandment is not to covet. Let's just put those together. And yet, what do we see from God himself? Even in the first four commandments, he's essentially saying, have no other gods before me. Speaking about his jealousy and his desire to be the only one. In the fifth book of the Bible, chapter four, verse 24, we get God saying this, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. In Joshua 24, we get the tie-in of God being both holy 
and jealous. In 1 Corinthians 10, 22, Paul talks about the jealousy of the Lord. It's not even just Old Testament God. We have a jealous God. And Christians have tried to make it sound pretty. He's jealous for us. He wants our love. That's domineering and it's abusive. If you had any other relationship where someone commanded that you love them or else suffer pain and death and torture, that kind of jealousy is not some sweet little, oh, I love my wife so much. It hurts me when she talks to other men, which is still problematic. God's jealousy is tied directly with his wrath. God's jealousy is a self-serving jealousy of wanting to be the only God, the best God, to be glorified, to be worshipped. Okay, so let's move on to number four. I'm going to do vindictive. Now, this is going to be close to five, which is unforgiving, but they're different. So for vindictive, we should be able to say that vindictive and vengeful are objectively wrong. God says not to hold grudges, not to be bitter, to turn the other cheek, which might be leading a little bit into forgiveness. But what do we see from God? How about Psalm 94, 1? O Lord, the God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, let your glorious justice shine forth. How about Leviticus 26? 25, and I will bring a sword upon you that shall execute vengeance for the covenant. And if you gather within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. In Isaiah 59, 17, we hear that he put on a garment of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in a fury as a mantle. When I think of God being vindictive, I think of all of the times that he smote people for innocuous acts, like when the Ark of the Covenant was about to fall and someone put their hand up to to steady it and God struck them dead. Or when Aaron's sons didn't quite do the fire ritual correctly and so they were both struck dead. We have a petty, vindictive, and vengeful God. This is a God that takes revenge, who claims it for himself. In fact, the only reason we might believe that vengeance is not okay is because God says, don't do it, it's mine, I get to. Again, it's tied to his perfect justice and holy wrath. So the excuse from Christians here is that this is part of God's justice. But what we see from God, and we'll see later on as he curses future generations and does all kinds of things that don't even pertain to the individual, is that he is petty. He does try to strike as hard and as long-lasting as he can. He is a God who loves to punish. Think about that. We didn't have to have a God who punishes. We could have had an all-good, all-forgiving God. This is his setup. This is his framework. Even if justice was required, the lengths and levels that we see this God go to throughout this Bible are absolutely and obviously vindictive. So let's move into example number five, which is going to be unforgiving. Now, surely this one is obvious. God tells us to forgive. Really what it's saying is always forgive. Forgive as I have forgiven you, which doesn't make much sense. I'd encourage you to watch my video on rationalizing redemption because God did not forgive at all. Adam and Eve messed up one time before they knew what right or wrong was, and he cursed everybody for all time. That is the opposite of forgiving. God used a blood sacrifice through Jesus so he could forgive us, but then we still have to believe in him. That doesn't make any sense. We 100% have a God who is not forgiving. Let me give you some examples from the Bible. How about Joshua 24, 19? And Joshua said unto the people, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. Here's the rest of that verse though. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. In 2 Kings 24, 3 through 4, you can read the context for yourself, but it ends with saying, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. So he can just turn this off, supposedly. Again, vindictive, vengeful, unforgiving, they're kind of running together, but in the fifth book of the Bible, 2920, the Lord will never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. Here's a fun thought. How about how God has not forgiven all of the angels and Satan himself? There's no redemptive path for them. Sure, we can think about how God likes to treat humans, but if it's his nature to be forgiving like he commands us to be, and since we're made in his image, isn't it interesting that he has absolutely no desire to do so? How about Jeremiah eleven fourteen? Therefore, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry of prayer on their behalf, for I will not listen when they call to me in their time of trouble. But in other verses, it says, pray and it will be answered where two or three are gathered. If it's God's will, it will be done. But I guess it's not God's will because he says, don't waste your time. I'm not going to do it. In Ezekiel 7, 3 through 4, it ends with, I will not look on you with pity. I will not spare you. Going back to vindictive, how about Proverbs 1, 24 through 30, where he says, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear cometh. This is because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Vindictive, vengeful, petty, 
unforgiving. But let's move on to point six, murder. You know, we talked about infanticide. We're going to talk next about genocide. So there's a few other ones, but I just want to talk straight up about murder. There are different iterations in semantics when it comes to this. Murder is defined as unjust killing, meaning some killing is just, right? We know that God thinks there's a time for war, but I guess where the problem with God's objective morality is, who decides when it's okay to kill. We have Christians on both ends of the spectrum when it comes to the death penalty. Both of them utilize the word of God for their reasoning. I think there is no better subjective example of God's morality here than the fact that only when it suits God or serves his purpose is killing, killing. And when it does not, killing equals murder. Exodus 20, 13 says, don't murder. And then almost immediately God is commanding Moses and then Joshua and then Saul and David and on and on and on to go and kill by the sword, destroy by the sword, take by the sword. The Christian excuses are ridiculous. We get things like militant grace, which is an absolutely horrendous thing that we'll make our own video on. But somehow, because God needed his chosen people to inhabit his chosen land, Canaan, all the death and destruction and murder or just killing along the way was completely permissible. Now, I understand in ancient times, war had to happen. War still happens. The nature of man is to conquer and invade, and murder is going to happen. It doesn't make it right, by the way, but God should be bigger than this, no? He has them wander around in the desert for 40 years. Why not use a miracle for God? good. Bless the land, have it grow into something better than Canaan, and give this uninhabited land as the chosen land for the chosen people. See, we get so stuck in God's current framework. Well, he had to kill these people. They were enemies of God. Why? Because God didn't choose for them to be chosen. That's why. That's ridiculous. So let's not use war examples because there's going to be way too many excuses, but I think you could and should take a step back to say, were all these wars in the Bible justified? Did they have to happen? Was there no other way for an all-powerful, all-knowing God? We can look at any of the infanticide examples as unnecessary murder. We can look at anyone whose family was punished because of their sin as unnecessary or unjust murder. We can look at any people that died after God hardened their hearts as unnecessary and unjustified murder. We can look at any punishment that has murder as its end result. There could have been less harsh punishments, right? What are we supposed to do with the girls who are not virgins on their wedding night? Return them to their father's doorstep and stone them. What are we to do with children when they disobey or dishonor the parents? We are to stone them to death. What are we supposed to do with the people who believe in other gods who might try to convince us of that? We are to kill them. There are literally too many examples. I have paralysis by analysis trying to think of all the different people in the Bible God kills. We're in the millions, by the way. The devil has nine or 10 or 11 most of which were when he killed Job's children, if you count that as the devil and not just the accuser, and even that was at the behest of God. God is a murderer. And yet, if you walked up to any Christian on the street today and said, is murder wrong? They would all say yes. Why does God get an excuse? Because he made the rules? Would we apply this anywhere else in life? No. Okay, so fine. I'll get on board. Murder is okay in some conditions because God's justice demands it, which is ridiculous. How do you then excuse genocide. Surely the wiping out of another people group completely should be wrong. We are told God is a loving God, a forgiving God, a God who desires for every single person to know him and to be saved, to have a relationship with each individual. How does that happen when entire people groups are wiped off the face of the planet? How do you believe God loves everyone, as John 3.16 tells us, if he has a chosen people group and tells them to commit mass murder and genocide on other people groups that are not part of the chosen. The examples here are almost endless, but I'll give you a few from the source material itself. I think the flood would be the first one, but we'll skip over that because I don't want to hear all the excuses. But if you need other examples, we can do Numbers 21, 2 through 3, Deut 20, 10 through 19, Judges 18, 1 through 28, 1 Samuel 15, 2 through 3, 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 8, Numbers 31, 7 through 40, Joshua 10, 28 through 40. By the way, that one is seven distinct genocides in less than 13 verses. Genocide of Jericho, which is found in Joshua 6, 21. There's like 11 more in Joshua. Joshua, more in 1 Samuel. Even as far as Jeremiah 50, 21, we have an example of actual genocide. Read these verses for yourself. Understand the context. Look at what happens before and what happens after to see that it is not hyperbole. How many innocent women and children? Hell, even the men 
were no worse, at least, than the Israelites. Most of the tribes that get genocided for their evil deeds, their sin, their rejection of God, their wickedness, etc., are literally no different or have done even less harm or even less against God, Yahweh, than his own chosen people group. This is a God of favorites. And if you're not a favorite and you disobey, you get completely destroyed, utterly destroyed taken apart. Okay, eight. This one's going to be a bit milky considering that 50% roughly of all Christians get divorced, but let's talk about divorce. Now, back in the Old Testament, you had Moses allowing people to get divorced, and this is under God's covenant for a multitude of reasons. When Jesus comes though, and this is in Matthew 19, 3 for a few verses, he says, let what God put together, no man take apart. Now he limits the exceptions from everything Moses gave down to just adultery. So if you ask Christians, is divorce wrong? The answer, according to Jesus, should be yes, unless adultery. And yet the answer you will get is yes. I mean, if someone's being abused, if they just weren't compatible and it's not healthy for the children to be around, if there's too much fighting and arguing, if he's too domineering. And yet the Bible makes none of these exceptions. But again, this isn't a video about how Christians don't follow God's law. It's how God can't decide. And going back to my original statement, that God is supposed to be immutable, and that is the only thing that would allow for his morality to be objective, is if it doesn't change, how did we get a change in God's opinion on divorce? Why are his arguably two greatest prophets, Moses and himself, in the form of Jesus, disagreeing? Why did the law change, right? Now, this could open up a whole other can of worms, which is some laws have changed. Some laws are actually just Old Testaments. I'm going to throw you Christians a bone. There are certain things that were Levitical law, that were just for the Jews, etc. But why, if we have an objective code written on our hearts, is that the case? It's no longer objective if people group to people group and time frame to time frame, some things are wrong sometimes under certain conditions, but not other times under others. That's the entire point of this video. There is no objective morality from God. So let's jump into a really difficult one or not so difficult. Number nine, sacrifice. Not just sacrifice, human sacrifice. And we can double down and make it even worse, child sacrifice. Have you ever heard a Christian talk about the ancient Mayans and how awful it was that they sacrificed so many people, even though this was most likely a lie perpetuated by the missionaries who went down there, at least to the extent that it happened? They talk about it with complete disdain. The Bible talks about sacrifice being wrong. In fact, as given the justification for half of the genocides, it is because the land of Canaan was filled with people who performed child sacrifice, and that was wrong. Therefore, God allowed them to genocide, which is also wrong. So if that's God's stance on sacrifice, we should see no human sacrifice, yet alone child sacrifice, from him. Let's look at just three examples, even though there's more. How about how the greatest test of faith was if Abraham was willing to kill his child? Ah, Brandon, gotcha. See, God didn't let him go through with it. God does not condone it. Just because God gave Abraham an out doesn't mean that he did not place a high value of importance in making sure that one of his followers was willing to kill his child for his belief in God. What that did, even though it didn't require the completion of the act, is it set up a hierarchy of God first over children. There may not be as many parents dragging their son up a mountainside to stab and burn their bodies, but that doesn't mean that God has not demanded he be put first over the life of a child. Many children have died because their parents spent their money, their time, their energy, their resources into God and not into their child. If God didn't like the idea of child sacrifice, he shouldn't have said that his friend, the only time God uses this word, Abraham, was justified, made righteous by his friend faith for the act of being willing to kill his child. But that's a hypothetical, I guess, since it didn't happen. So example two would be that of Jephthah, who makes a deal with God that he will kill the first thing out of his house if God gives him a victory. Now, we see God chastise neighboring people groups for doing exactly this, for doing child sacrifice to enact victory through their God. But he allows it with Jephthah. He takes the deal with the foreknowledge that the first thing out of his house would be his daughter. It is so simple. 
That is so clear. God accepts of child sacrifice. He gave a victory to this man because of what he was willing to give up, which was his child. And yes, God made him go through with it, unlike Abraham. So every time I hear that stupid excuse about how God didn't make Abraham do it, he made Jephthah do it. And the one that somehow people just completely forget and ignore, God commits child sacrifice himself. God killed his only begotten son. It's his actual blueprint for salvation. It is his way to connect. It is the blood magic sacrifice needed to atone for our awful sinful nature that he allowed us to have and pass down to us generationally through Adam and Eve. Hear me loud and clear. God is a fan to the utmost of child sacrifice. Okay. Let's go to something lighter than child sacrifice. Let's go to point 10. We're only halfway there. I promise I'll start speeding up. And that's going to be other forms of marriage. We'll just breeze right through this one. I am told all the time in the comments, and I hear it all the time from Christians, that the Bible is clear. Marriage is a union between one man and one woman, unless it is between a man and his slave. That's a little bit different. It's still man and woman, but slave to master? How about a man and his concubine? Or, my personal favorite, all the God-given, God-ordained, God-blessed polygamy in the Bible. That's one man and multiple women. Up to 700 if we believe the accounts of Solomon. But many of the kings had entire harems of wives and concubines. And yet, go ask any modern-day Christian woman who has read the Bible and rightly so believes that marriage is between one man and one woman, if she's okay with her husband having multiple partners and girls on the side? The answer is no. This is the objective morality written on her heart. It is a union, a blessed union between two souls. A blessed union of souls? I did not mean to do that. Love is the answer. That's hilarious. So a lot of murky, muddy waters. Then you add in the divorce stuff and the idea of marriage and the objectivity around what constitutes marriage morals is absolutely ridiculous, according to this God. While we're playing around of this sexual level, let's move into point 11, which is rape. Now, this one should be so obvious, right? In fact, it's the main thing I hear from Christians. What stops the atheist from running around raping and pillaging? They love that phrase, because supposedly the only thing stopping them from raping people, the most base desire of man is their belief in God and adherence to his objective morality. So, does God hate rape? Well, not for when he punished David by having all of his wives raped by someone that David knew closely outside in public. And that's not the only time that God uses rape as punishment, which I'd love to know how that works. How is the free will for the men who are sent to rape this woman? How is the free will for the woman who is now getting raped? We also see a ton of issues with women who have been raped if they didn't cry loud enough to show that they weren't enjoying it, being subject to punishment and murder. We see rape victims forced to marry their rapists. We'll be talking about slavery for point 20, and there's plenty of sexual slavery, which obviously involves rape, that is 100% condoned and endorsed by God. You can rape your enemies. You can rape as punishment. Can you imagine if a judge ordered that in a court of law? You can be murdered for being raped because it seemed like you liked it. It's disgusting. Disgusting. Please tell me again all this stuff about God's good morality. Let's stay on this train and move right into example 12, which is going to be incest. Surely incest is wrong. This is more of just a fun thought experiment. I won't use the typical verses like how Lot's daughters essentially raped their father, which was needed, by the way, for the genealogies that are going to be important, that God would use that. But how do you think, if you believe in the accounts of either part of Genesis, the world came into being? Human population grew after the garden or after the flood. It requires incest period. And that's God's ideal, right? God could have put other people on the boat that were not related to Noah. God could have started with multiple chains of families in the garden so that there would not be incest. By the sheer design, whether literal or metaphor, of what we are told happens in Genesis, we have to believe that God utilized incest as the means for reproduction for early settlement of the land by humans. So we have necessary incest in Genesis and by Leviticus it is outlawed. God's objective morality? 
I don't know. 13 will be quick because we've kind of talked about it, but how about adultery? This is definitely bad. We know it. God says it. Jesus says it. Even looking at a woman with lust in your heart is considered the exact same sin as committing adultery itself. We even see King David, one of God's favorites, being punished. Well, not him being punished, his son and other wives being punished for his adultery that he committed with Bathsheba. So yeah, God says adultery is wrong unless he blesses you with multiple wives. I guess it's not adultery if they're also your wife. But if marriage is just between one man and one woman, then how do we ever get a second wife? Oh, because God's morality is not so objective. What about when Abraham had sex with his slave, Hagar. I can prove to you that this was approved by God because when Hagar got pregnant from that and ran away because Sarah had been so upset that she was mistreating her, what did God do? He sent an angel to go and retrieve Hagar and bring her back to her master. Abraham. And he continued to bless Abraham, which by the way, we see God removing covenants and blessings left and right in the Old Testament when people disobey him. And yet supposedly every single promise that God made Abraham came to fruition. But adultery is always wrong unless God needs it for fulfillment of his plans. Okay. 14 is a fun one. Animal cruelty. Well, Brandon, listen, we were given dominion over the animals, okay? What we do with them, how we utilize them for food or shelter, or clothing, whatever, like, you know, that's why God gave them to us. But Proverbs 12, 10 states that a righteous man cares for the needs of his animal. That looks like some part of God's morality and plan for us to take care of his creation, take care of these animals. He created animals with some form of sentience, some form of consciousness and pain receptors that work in them the same way that it works in us, and yet commands so much animal sacrifice, so much butchering and murdering of animals. When he sends plagues, he doesn't just send them on people. He sends them on animals. When he needs to give us a food source, he sends animals except for that time where he was doing manna, but he also did quails. And he also gave us all these animals supposedly for us to feed on, to hunt down with primitive weapons that would not kill immediately, etc. God created animals to feel pain and then gave us the go ahead to create the pain, but also tells us to take care of them, be stewards of them, and that righteous men will treat them well. That word objective is starting to sound really weird to me all of a sudden. While we're talking about the confusion of what rules we follow when, let's move into point 15, which is observance of the Sabbath. Now, bring in, that's clearly an Old Testament thing, but Jesus came to uphold and fulfill the law. Jesus was accused of not honoring the Sabbath, but God of the Old Testament smites a dude who's picking up sticks to keep his family warm and fed on the Sabbath. But then God doesn't get mad when people are working on the Sabbath when Nehemiah is building the wall, at least not to the point of any consequence, like how he struck the one dude dead. Man, this is confusing. It's almost like it's completely subjective. Another completely subjective standard would be example 16, which is God punishing future generations. Now, first of all, we have Adam and Eve as the prototypical mother and father that introduced sin into the world and thus original sin on everyone. And then we have specific verses where God does curse people to the fourth generation. Then we have other verses where God says, I will not curse children for the sins of their father or parents for the sins of their children. We still hear about generational curses today. Go to any evangelical church and you're going to see spirits of dissension, spirits of alcohol, spirits of pornography, spirits of lust that have been generationally handed down. You're going to learn and see YouTube videos about how to break the cycle of generational sin. But I thought God didn't do that anymore. But we still need Jesus to atone for our original sin that was passed down to us from whom? Our earliest father. Man, this is so confusing. 17. Let's get into matters of equality. I hear apologists talk left and right about our inherent dignity as creatures and creation of God. So we won't talk about God's homophobia. We won't talk about God's racism, what we will actually in an upcoming point. Let's zero in on equality just between men and women. Let's talk about the inequality of women. Let's talk about misogyny. Let's talk about God's misogynistic tendencies. If we truly have a God who created man and woman separate but equal, why are women worth two thirds that of a man? Why are women subordinate to their husband? Why are women not allowed to speak in church or to teach men? Why was man created first and woman was an afterthought? Why is lineage only important because of the man you came from and women are never mentioned in these genealogies? Women literally don't count in the polls, biblically speaking. God's covenant is with men only 
family. Only males can be priests. God has sons, never daughters. If a priest's daughter sleeps around, burn her. Says nothing about a priest's son. Women are considered property to the extent that they are even swappable property. Daughters can be sold on the same conditions as slaves. In fact, the only reason that rape is ever considered wrong in the Bible is because it harms the property of a man. That's why the justice that comes from a rape is for that man to be repaid for his lost property or his devalued property. Only witches, female witches, were killed. In fact, it says a mother is doubly unclean if she has a daughter. <laughs> this is insane. Menstruation is an infirmity that requires a sin penance. Only women who are accused of cheating, because men can't really cheat, have to go through that magic trial of eating the dirt potion to make themselves barren or get an abortion for doing harm against the man. Inheritance only goes through male members unless there is no males to do so. God allows polygamy only for men, and the list goes on and on and on and on. We will be doing a dedicated video to just what God thinks of women, because if you are a woman who believes that God is your good, good father, who believes that you are protected and loved and valued as an heiress of grace. You're a fool and you haven't read your Bible. You don't know your God. We have three left. Let's do cannibalism, racism, and slavery. And for 18 for cannibalism, let's get back to actually reading from some of these. Leviticus 26, 27. But if in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury. And I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. Wow, we could have used this verse for a lot. Here we go, though. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters, and my soul will abhor you. Holy shit. Forced cannibalism of your sons and daughters as punishment. Remember, folks, God is never changing. If this worked for God once, he's down with it for eternity. Let's do another one. Jeremiah 19, 7. And in this place, I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem, and will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies, and by the hand of those who seek their life, I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds of the air and to the beast of the earth. And I will make this city a horror, a thing to be hissed at. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of its wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. This is just par for the course for this God. Let's move on to number 19 racism. Now, God is no respecter of persons, we are told in this book. We are told that God has a plan for everyone. We are told that God loves everyone, that we are all his creation, all made in the image of God. So no other person would be less than because of their ethnicity, correct? I mean, the first thing to bring up is that most of the genocide was because people were of the wrong people group. But let's see if we can find some more specific verses. How about Nehemiah 13, 23 through 30? I won't read you the whole thing, but interracial marriage here is seen as a great evil. Or in Genesis 9, 24 through 27, we see that the descendants of one of Noah's grandsons, which would go on to become their own people group, were cursed by God to become the slaves of the others. In Exodus 23, 23, we see God saying that these other people groups will not get to live in your land, and furthermore, that they will be cut down. In Nehemiah 13, 3, we see a command to kick out all of the foreigners, all of the mixed. Wives and children were sent off essentially to die because God and Ezra were so displeased with the intermarriage that had happened, even though they were all worshiping Yahweh at that time. In Judges 12, 4 through 6, the foreigner's accent offends thee so much that 42,000 are struck dead. A verse that we'll be utilizing for our final point about slavery, Leviticus 25, 40, 44 says that you can only buy slaves from neighboring nations. This is like the definition of racism. And if you really want to see the extent and the horror of God's racism, go read Numbers 25. But let's move on to slavery. Now, I've done two videos on slavery. I've done one that's a little bit more all-inclusive, and I list many verses in that video. That's this one here. And then I did a response to Trent Horn's excuse of slavery that is a little more specific. That's this one here. And I'd encourage you to go watch those, and all the videos I've listed today will be in my description. But slavery is something that should be wrong, right? How many Christians today own slaves or would say that slavery is okay or permissible? Like none 
right? Like this is something that we know is wrong. This is something that goes against the claims of the Bible about everyone's inherent dignity and importance and made in the image of God and everything else that I've listed. Of course, there's the odd wacko who says, well, you know what? We are God's chosen people and we should be able to do this. But like almost no one in their right mind would say slavery is okay, except for God. And you can go read that verse in Leviticus, and I dare you to try to make the same excuses that apologists make. Oh, it's indentured servitude. Oh, it's actually beneficial for the individual. Oh, they wouldn't have had any other options. You mean any other options after the commanded mass murder, if not genocide, of all the males in their village? We're also going to be talking here about sexual slavery, where men are all the men are murdered, all the children are murdered, all the older women are murdered, except for what? Virginal young women? Why do you think they were kept? Well, Brandon, God had the Israelites make them wives. Oh, that's cool. That made everything better. Those women definitely wanted to be there. They definitely wanted to have sexual relations with the people that just killed their fathers. You're right. All good. Here's the fact. Despite whatever stupid excuse, and they are stupid to the utmost, you will make for why God actually is against slavery. You are wrong. God condones it. God endorses it. God approves of it. He gives specific instructions. None of the other stupid excuses about how God was having to deal with people where they were and meeting them, where they were at, etc., work here because God had no problem outlawing a thousand other things with way less consequence that were also things of these people's time and context. If God had thought slavery was wrong, he would have said so. But the fact is God's not real, and the people who wrote the Bible at the time didn't think slavery was wrong. And they wanted slaves, so they wrote it in for themselves. In fact, the only time that slavery was wrong in the Bible is when it was the Israelites in captivity in Egypt, because once again, God's morality is 100% subjective to his desired outcome for his plan. And his plan was for his chosen people. So when they're in slavery, slavery is bad. But minutes later, after they're out of slavery, he's telling them how to go and buy slaves from other nations. The exact thing that was supposedly so wrong. So the next time that a believer tells me I have no right to call anything wrong, even though I am not the one who is subscribing to an objective morality, I'm going to point you back to this video and you will need to explain to me why your God is so okay allowing, commanding, or doing himself these 20 horrific supposedly objective, immoral actions. When you can do that, we can have a real conversation on morality. Morality is subjective. Get over it. It's not emotionally appealing. It is what we are left at as creatures that have evolved over time into groups and societies that have to coexist and figure out a way of keeping peace or encouraging flourishment and prosperity. And that has changed and is subject to change over time and culture and place, period. Get over it. Slapping a God seal on that doesn't all of a sudden make it true. And even if it were, it doesn't make it objective. And even if somehow it is objective, your God doesn't care about it and neither do the followers of this God. This is a ridiculous Hail Mary from Christians or believers against the evils of atheism because they can't figure out why there would be any reason not to be an atheist unless you can concoct ridiculous things like we need a God for meaning, we need a God for morality. No no, you don't. No, you don't. I'm moral and I have meaning in my life and I have no God. And there are millions of other people just like me. And I'd argue that we have the potential to be even more moral, to create even more meaning, because we are not just renting it out to religion. Because we are taking advantage of understanding we're here just for today. Because we do have consequences for our actions, because we don't have a scapegoat willing to take all penalty and payment and believe that this life doesn't even matter and I'll be rewarded in the next one, not for what I do, but what I believe believe or think. It is the Christian who has the wholehearted excuse of doing whatever the hell they want because they have a God who is willing to excuse everything simply because they have the right person's magical blood on their side. There is so much confusion, brokenness, contradiction, and error when we look at a immutable God and his standard for how we should live our life and what is right and what is wrong, what is permissible, and what is subject to punishment. So let me know in the comments below what other ones you would add. If you think I'm wrong about something, tell me which one and give me why I don't have the context correct. By the way, if I'm not wrong about every single last one of these, it only takes one to crack objectivity, right? The second that some part of morality is subjective, it's all subjective. So 
good luck proving God's objective morality. Thanks for listening. I will shut up now. Have a wonderful day. I will see you on Tuesday with another Tuesday Takedown, and Thursday we will be talking about Esther. Make sure you check out my appearance on Apologia, and if you have missed it, I was on The Hang Up with Matt Delahunty just last week, and I really had a wonderful time doing that. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day, and until next time, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tier Iconoclast patrons, Jason Rollins and Sean Skaggs, as well as my atheist advocate patrons, Elijah Jeffrey and Jared Nichols for their incredible generosity. I also wanted to give a huge shout out to all of my secular scholar patrons. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. If you enjoyed these videos or want to help support the mission, please consider joining these great patrons. Thank you and have a wonderful day.